Welcome to the Listen for Life Aphasia podcast. I'm your host, Genevieve, and this week I have a special treat. We are going to meet Glenda Molina in just a few minutes. And the reason I asked Glenda to join us today is she is a financial advisor. And those of you in the stroke community, aphasia community, or if you're dealing with any kind of neurologic, new onset, progressive disease, your finances are an important thing to consider, right? And there's planning and whether or not you've planned before, you can work with a financial advisor to make sure your money is there for when you need it and to figure all that out. So I'm asking Linda to talk to us today to share a little bit of information about what you might need to know and what a financial advisor could do for you. And we'll get started in just a moment. Welcome to the Listen for Life podcast with Genevieve Richardson. Genevieve is a speech language pathologist rehabilitating adults with communication challenges after a stroke or due to a neurological impairment. Get equipped with knowledge from experts in the field and professionals you need to know. We'll hear stories and experiences from others who are navigating life with aphasia. So put your earphones in and take a walk outside. This isn't just a podcast. This is a community, a resource, and a support system. We're in this together. Do life. Good afternoon, Glenda. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hello. Thank you for inviting me onto the show. So happy to have you here. So we were introduced by a mutual friend, Medicare Dana. God love her. And we're going to talk some finances. Can you tell us a little bit about you and your background and what you do? Yeah, well, I'm Glenda Molina. I'm a wealth advisor here based in Austin, Texas, and I have a passion for empowering individuals and families to really reach and achieve their financial goals, that financial freedom so that they can live joyfully. And I think we talked about this before. It's really, you've reached to a certain level, but you have to make sure that you're actually having fun and you're living that your life joyfully because, as you know, different health events can happen. And that's really where I'm really passionate about because I had a health event a few years back. And when those type of things happen, you feel a loss of control. And I really like to help clients get that control back in any way that they can. And that's really what the financial planning component of overall wealth advisory that we do. And that's so that they can see that roadmap ahead, that they can hit those milestones, that they're making sure that they're getting their finances under control. Because as you know, healthcare expenses can add up really quickly. And if you don't have the resources to really pay for those expenses, that's really really where we can help. And then also, if you are lucky enough to have like long-term care or they're just um, cash reserves for a major health event on hand, we can really help help you to optimize that uh, so it can last as long as possible. Yes. Love that. Okay, so let's jump into the thick of it. So let's say a husband and wife are coming to see you because the husband had a stroke Mm -hmm. and they have no idea where they stand on their finances. He took care of it before. He took care of all those things. They have some kind of retirement account, but the wife doesn't really know. And she's coming into you with a stack of papers, stack of statements. And what does that first meeting kind of look like? What are, what are you looking for? What are you asking about? Great question. And that actually happens a lot. So what happens is that they'll come into the conference room. They usually have, um, I would say, folders, like four, there was like, and this one client had four different folders. And really what I'm looking for is first things first, if there's any outstanding bills, because we have to make sure that those get paid first. We don't want their credit to take a hit. The second thing we're looking for is, like you mentioned, different brokerage account statements, retirement account statements, any kind of legacy accounts that could get rolled over. Because what we're trying to do is consolidate as many accounts as possible. So that way, whoever is the, the main caregiver, they have access to all those resources. And once we can lay that out and create a, a financial plan where they can see all the 
different assets that they have and the liabilities, the next thing is, is for that spouse to make sure that she can gain access to those accounts. And that usually comes in with the estate planning document called a durable power of attorney, a financial power of attorney. So say if the spouse had just an individual broker account, brokerage account that was only in his name, well, the wife doesn't have access to that until we can add it on. It's a document that you have to provide to the custodian. And then it depends. Generally, if it's not immediate, you require two letters from a physician or some other kind of documentation to prove that you are that power of attorney and that role and that fiduciary role for them. So once we have those components, then once we get access to everything and I can see what kind of resources we can work with, then we come up with um, a budget to figure out what kind of expenses that they have um, as far as normal living expenses and what kind of additional expenses these med- the medical expenses are causing. And so for us, for what I've seen is that can be upwards to anywhere from just a few hundred dollars because they're just having a home health care aid come in a few times a week to anywhere that they may be considering we need additional uh, assistance. And then we have to figure out that budget. So once we get to that point, then we come up, I call it a paycheck. We'll send the client a paycheck from the brokerage account because we'll figure out an investment strategy to generate enough income from the distributions and div- like the dividends to really come up with enough funds to pay for those expenses. So it's a really good, we, we work with the clients to figure out their investment strategy. And if the spouse was never one of those individuals that was really, usually what I've seen with spouses is one takes care of the finances, the other one takes care of like the general household. And it can be either female or male, whoever, but it's generally that person who, if they've never really dealt in this, they can be really overwhelmed. And what we do is I use a special mind mapping technique So it's for visual, really for visual learners. So we can break down like this is what you have and to simplify those concepts that they may otherwise not know. And it's as simple as like if they say if they see an IRA account, they're like, well, what is that? What am I required to do with it? What's what's going on? There's special rules sometimes that you have to adhere to. So those are the type of things that we'll do. We'll do a breakdown with them to go over what they have what they probably need to take care of first and just create those action steps for them and usually create a timeline. So I say, Hey, this is what we need to get done within this month. This is within the next three months. This is within the next six months. And we have accountability. We'll have our different sessions in between because that's what we really become is a quarterback for you. We're really there to help you similar to like how you and I connected is I find those resources for my clients so that they can be, in a better place than they were, what they were before. So that's a general idea. I, I love it. So I'm, you know, I've spoken with lots of financial advisors over the years, but I've never met one like you that's really <laughs> looking at the whole picture and really helping a family map it all out with the timeline, with understanding all of the wheels that are turning and getting access to like, it sounds like you are really there with them. Going exactly. Those steps. It's, it's, people say, is this hand holding? But it's the same, the way I like to think about it, if something were happening to my parents or to myself, what kind of service would I like for them to like help me with or to deliver? And that's exactly how, and if it's like for my father or my mom, it's one of these things that it's just like, I would want them to be every step of the way. I wouldn't want them to have any questions. We would try to get all those questions answered. I would like them to feel that they are in control, that they're not sad, and if they don't have access to something, that we can get access to them for whatever they need. Because that's another thing. One spouse may have all the passwords to all the different accounts. Amen. And we sit down and we'll go, we'll go figure out how to reset the password, create the password. I'll sit down with the clients. We'll call the different financial institutions. We'll try to get access. And then if not, that's when we sort of work with the attorney to get access to their accounts that way. So there might be some steps that we have to take in advance in order to get everything done, but that's what we're here for. Wow. I love that. And you also have an attor- attorneys that work in your office, so it could be a one-stop shop. Yeah, we have we have uh, attorney as far as like resources, but usually no, I give, because my clients are as you know, they're nationwide. So we do have different referrals that we send them out to. But they usually have different specialties, like if it's elder care or special needs trust, we do have access to those. Mm -hmm. Nice. Okay, so that scenario was 
a stroke scenario where they they're playing catch up. Mm -hmm. Let's take it from a different perspective of now a different husband, not picking on the same family, <laughs> has been diagnosed with something like primary progressive aphasia or a Parkinson's or they have some kind of, you know, something that deteriorates over time. How is the financial, let's say they just got a diagnosis. I'm sure we could get into the weeds on all this, but let's say it's a relatively new diagnosis and they want to get prepared. So I went back through my old notes to really track some of the timelines for my clients who have had uh, something similar like FTD and um, the Alzheimer's as well. And it really, so the way it came about was we get an email, the client states, we just had a diagnosis, it's X, Y, Z. And so from there, we're like, okay, that's when the timeline, like we had mentioned, that's when the, the clock starts. And so generally what I've seen is we like to keep the client. And then afterwards, in the event that they have to move into some sort of assisted living, memory care, there's two types of clients that we work with or that we've had instances. One is where a client, in one case, it was early onset dementia, like 15 years before really I had projected in their financial plan that a health event was going to happen. So this accelerated their timeline. And because of that, what we had to do, they didn't necessarily have the liquidity at that time. So we did a cash out refi from their home. We accessed that, that cash. We invested it in a way so that it can generate. And in this case, we'll just use an example, it was a million dollars. They had a million dollars that we had access to now. With that, I was able to generate about 80,000 to, to send for, and this is thinking that the memory care is about 6,000 in this one specific part of the, the country. If you're talking about Austin, that is not the case, it's around 10,000. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, and so that's what we helped to do. We facilitated all the different paperwork that was needed for to get to the mortgage broker in order for them to get the best quote as far as like what interest rates were, and then to see what kind of value or I guess the equity that they could access in their home. And then really after that, it was really sitting down with them to figure out, okay, what does that look like? Because you're sort of maintaining two households. You're maintaining the household of the individual who's going to be in this other facility. And then the person who's still maintaining the household in their home now. So you're dealing with two different types of expenses. So we had to run projections and numbers for both in order to make sure that they're adequately taken care of. In this case, they're still, what we like to do is preserve their capital, that principal balance and the income that's generating off the account. That's what's really paying for all the different expenses. So that's what we like to do. And so far it's been really successful. And this client, this event happened to them in 2022. So that's one example in the event that like, if you don't necessarily have enough liquidity or access cash, because if you, who has some people, Generally, everything should be invested, but if some people will have their cash reserves, 80,000 or 100,000 in cash reserves, but that's just one year of expenses. What happens after that? What do you, what do you do? So that's why it's a very scary situation, but that's what we're here for as well as advisors to come in and really help facilitate that process. And like I said, that's really finding if we have to access and see if there's other investments held outside or if there's anything else that we can do. And in some cases, even if they had some real estate, sometimes we'll have clients that have like property. We'll go ahead and sell it at that time if if it's if they're not really using it. At this point in time, it's just like, oh, I used to have a home in New Mexico, but I don't foresee myself going out with my wife in the RV, like with the RV out there anymore. So that's something that we'll do. So we'll help them with that process, really just to consolidate their accounts. Now, the second type of client is if they were lucky enough at a young age, when they worked at an engineering office, or maybe just even as a teacher, they had a long-term care policy. That's something else that we like to talk through is when is the time to submit that claim for it? Because as you know, in some of the different policies, and I'm looking at one right now, they usually have either a 90-day elimination period where you have to wait for 90 days until you can actually uh, put a claim on. And in this case, for this one client, they had a lifetime maximum benefit of 610000 so really, if they're showing that the long-term care benefit is going to be $331 a day, that means it'll really only last about um, five years or so. And so that's the thing is that we have to time this out to figure out if 
this diagnosis has a, a time period that they can live anywhere from five to seven years to 10 to 12 years to as long as 15. That's where, that's where we try to figure out when is the best time to submit a claim and how long can they last with being self-funded with their own personal investments. And we help to figure that out. That's what we do is we run the cash flow analysis to really look in and see, hey, this year's 2024, 2025, 2026, at that time period. If, and, and that's another thing. You just can't really, as you know, like with some of the, like even with FTD, it's a very aggressive, very quickly the client can deteriorate. And so then we have to figure, we work with the, the professionals, the medical professionals to really give us that, that hindsight as, as to what to do. But that's that main process. And both ways, even when we, I think that's another thing is because with the long-term care, I'll be on the phone with the client and I'm usually asking and sort of directing those questions, or they usually give me permission. Generally, they give me permission to speak <laughs> to the representative directly. And so then we'll ask them because the first thing to do is sometimes they don't have their most up-to-date long-term care policy statement. And so what we have to do is request that because they'll have it from like 1991. I'm like, where's the most recent version? <laughs> right. You know, that, and if they have in their policy is what a uh, cost of living adjustment, COLA. If they have a COLA, sometimes I'll see it as 3% or 5%. That value that was stated at that time is actually a lot more in today's uh, value. And so it actually would be called automatic benefit increase percentage equals 5%. So in this case, and this is because I'm jealous, like they don't really have these policies anymore, but it's showing that this policy increases 5% every year mm -hmm. until we actually submit a claim. At that point in time, then that cost of living adjustment actually stops because then you've already initiated using the benefit for that. Mm -hmm. Wow. So much stuff. And uh, another component, probably not directly part of you, but uh, Medicare, you know, <laughs> That's yes, and then so here versus an advantage plan versus supplements and, you know, just all the health care insurance, too. Exactly. And so that's where this is usually they've used all the resources available. And this is where we have to like normally they're tapping into whatever they have available because I'm like sometimes they either have like if they're on TRS, TRS card, like it just depends on, on what their, I guess, health or medical benefits that they have access to. And what I've seen, I think if someone is, and it's like I had mentioned before when we were talking earlier, if a client already knows that my mom or my dad um, had or have dementia or Alzheimer's, that's something, some, that's a really key for them that they should meet with a financial advisor or I me mean, as like a wealth advisor, which is one and the same, um, earlier, uh, sooner than later, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's just because we need to plan for that in advance. And it's the same thing. Some people don't even think about like, oh, with life insurance too. Like if you know if you're going to, your longevity is not as, you're not, you don't seem like you're going to last until a hundred, but it's more like 80 or 76. And that's something you would consider too, is like, do I have life insurance? Am I, if something were to happen to me or my kid's going to be okay without me, is the mortgage going to get paid? These are the types of questions. And, and normally what happens is it's not, you're really asking it's because it's it's when it's going to happen eventually and so that's when if you come into the office and we have a conversation we can really help you get set up so that's what we do i think one question i have right off the top some someone's going to say i don't have enough money to talk to a wealth manager i don't have wealth okay so if they say that there are i always like i'm a so I've always been uh, really passionate about the community, giving back. So there are services available. So one of them is found like here in Austin, and there's probably some uh, services somewhere elsewhere, uh, like nationwide too, but it's called Foundation Communities and they offer financial coaching. And if you make less than 60,000, they offer uh, a few sessions that you can meet with a financial coach. And the financial coaches there, they go through training a couple of sessions they have to go to how to speak to clients, how to use a different software, and they can run, they can pull your credit report to see things and help you with really, because in this case, if you don't really have financial resources, it's two things we're trying to deal with. It's like debt management, because you're probably going to be putting things on credit card. How do we, how do we do, how do we mitigate and minimize going into debt? And then the second thing is say, hey, I do have this medical bills and they've already went to collections okay, what do we do next? Like, how do we negotiate with that? And sometimes even before it goes to collections, because you have within six months, you can contact the, the hospital or like there's two stories. So you can contact the hospital and say, hey, I don't have this. You 
first thing you want to do is ask for an itemized bill. And you want to make sure that there's they're not charging you twice for an x-ray or some non-essential things. That's when you ask questions and say if the bill is for 5000 you can try to bring it down to 2000 You try to negotiate. That I've, That's worked for me like a couple of times for clients. And then sometimes if it has already gone to the collections route, then that's when we're trying to figure out how we can come up with an agreement with them to get into more, to pay, to pay it off sooner than later. So I think there's a couple of letters that they can draft for you at Foundation Committees when I was there. They would send off to the agencies and then they'll respond back to see if they accept your payment plan. And that's if like if you can do $25 or $100, it's, it's one of those things as far as resources. Because the last thing we want is for you to go bankrupt from this, but it can happen. And if it does, then that's when you're trying to figure out what resources are available to you. And I think that's one of the, that's a free option that's available. So that's like first cool. It's really good to know about that. So I'll I'll make sure to look that up and see what we have here in Austin. And I can link to that in the show notes. Just, mm -hmm. you know, just, you, you just don't know what someone's going to need. So what would you say would be, if someone's wanting to be proactive, they don't have the medical diagnosis yet. Maybe, you know, does financial planning change depending on what decade you're in, you know, someone in their thirties, forties, fifties, sixties, seventies. Good question. And that's because yeah, I, I, I know it's a loaded question. Right? <laughs> it's because I have clients. Yeah. I'm going to tell you the answer is yes. I, if a wealth advisor job is to plan for these catastrophic events. Now is the client, my younger clients may not be as perspect, like perceptive to it, to doing these certain strategies or techniques that we're supposed to do to plan for these events. Mm -hmm. But if they are, it's the same thing. Like I may even like with Dana with the Medicare, she also does like cancer insurance. So I may even say like, if you have like if cancer runs in the family, this may be something to consider. Yes, it may. And because you're younger, that out of pocket expense is a lot less than it would be if at age 50. So that's something to consider. So the, the thing is, when you're younger, I try to, and it's even with their savings. Generally, we we'll always make sure like they're doing two, like two or three different kinds of savings. You're saving that work through your 401k or retirement plan. Then you're saving for just your general emergency savings, uh, travel, and then your different. I also like, put, I call one that says joy. And it's because joy is not necessarily your fund, but it's called, it's my emergency fund. But it's because I don't like calling emergency fund because I really don't want to jinx it. I don't want anything bad to happen. Uh, I like it. So, so it's saying like keeping everything still and positive. But I think that's where you try to guide clients to add additional savings or to consider these different things. But yes, as you get older, it becomes more of the conversation. And really in all my, I usually do like an agenda with my clients and on is life updates. And one of the key things is health. It's interesting enough because in the very beginning, when I would ask this question, clients didn't really want to open up with me. And then afterwards it was TMI. <laughs> like I get too much information. But what I've seen is that um, like for different characteristics, like if something happened to a client where they were getting like dizziness and different headaches, and then I find out that there was a brain tumors or like there was different things, but they didn't catch it. That's the same thing that I tell another client, Hey, ask your, ask your, your general like physician or whoever you go work with, like your endocrinologist, or whoever, ask them to run these certain tests or ask them to look at these certain things. Cause so that's what you're having. Like, since I have such a peer group, of different ages and different people. For my younger clients, I can tell them, hey, these are some things you need to look out for. And for my older clients who are already sort of experiencing at the same time as my other clients, I'm usually giving them references and referrals to like, hey, check out this doctor, check out this person. Like these are the different things because health is probably your number one priority. Finances are always, are I, a very, no, I would say they're also number one priority, but as far as right. overall, you need to be in really good health or just, healthy in general, in order to live and spend your money, like to have fun and to enjoy it. Cause that's another thing. What I've realized is that for, if I'm talking to younger clients, I tell them have as much fun as you can now go on those vacations, do different things. Cause clients have tendency to wait until at retirement, but at retirement, you have mobility issues. You have other, you just become very, 
in your ways in the sense that like, I don't want to deal with a million people at the airport. Like, so you're less inclined to actually travel yet. You know, so it's one of these things that you have to, <laughs> like you said, you have an inter Yeah. Cause you have such a peer group and because you are looking very holistically at finances, but you're also looking at the health and you're looking at joy and you're trying to keep it all positive. And yes. someone like yourself, who's a wealth advisor, can see the nuances when I might say I've got this account and I got this account and I got this account and I may not see the big picture whereas you can see the I love, yeah I love that you say that because that I, I work with different types of clients and I have a client that's a therapist uh, and this is just sort of off topic but she she was sort of transitioning because she was already retiring where she wasn't going to be able to do therapy anymore. But then she wanted to like, but she could still be a coach. She was trying to drop her license so she could start to reduce the number of hours because she told me that specific detail about her life. I have another client who's a therapist who's considering slowing down with the next few years. And I was like, have you considered this or have you? And then another thing was I told this other client because she was like going to be doing potentially if she learns Spanish, and she works for a personal injury attorney like if they could advocate for her like she becomes the advocate for the different client she can bill at a higher a higher rate so there's certain things this is what i mean that like all the different clients give me all this different information that i can share with other individuals and that's why when they use certain resources within the community here in austin from the different like like one of the other guests that you had the care, the care patrol i can use that recommendation to send us to someone else because they've had a really good um, experience with them. So that's the key. It's really building that network of resources so I can provide to clients. And when you're looking at a client, when they're looking at their different things, they may not see everything, but that's what I'm here for is to ask those questions. That's what I was talking about. Is there any other real estate? Do you think you're gonna be having any kind of other inheritance? Is there some kind of like legacy 401k? Like maybe when you were 23, you worked at this one company. Well, we can go and do like here in Texas, you can look up unclaimed property. Maybe there's some money there that's been lying around that you had in a bank account that you didn't like remember or some kind of refund that you may have gotten back. We found some cash that way for clients, surprisingly. <laughs> it takes an extra step to like file, uh, go through the process to file it, to, to have proof of it, but but it's worked and we and we found different ways. So that's what I mean as far as like, we don't, I don't give up. We try to, if there's a will, there's a way, like you try to make things happen and to your best of your ability. And so, yeah. What kind of documents do you think every family needs to have? Great question. So I'll start with the everyday ones that you probably should have, which is where a list of all the different passwords like someone needs to have access to this yeah. <laughs> number and yes that's the number one like if we're just like if everything's that's the number one the second thing is i had one client have this whole separate binder that says in case i die or i go missing like this is how like this is a different documentation these are the banks i have this is where you have like where do you bank at who are my attorneys who's the C like who's the cpa who do who are all these different professionals that you work with who are my doctors? What, I need a prescription list. That happened to my dad the other day. He went to the doctor, but my mom wasn't there. And they asked the nurse asked, what prescriptions do you have? He's like, I don't know. You should know this. It should be in my file. <laughs> so what we did was we laminated a little card for him to put in his wallet. So that way he could just show the card instead. So it's making things easy for clients to do certain things. But then after that, it's more or less your estate planning documents. And that's when you need a will, a medical power of attorney, making sure you have a durable power of attorney. And I know you've had, you speak about these in, in different like other podcasts so they could probably go and reference those. But then also there's like the HIPAA release, just to make and giving people authorized, authorized to speak on your behalf in the event that you need that. Another thing that's key is in your social security, you can add a different, it's called a representative that you can add on there so that they can call into social security if they need to access the account you can add i think up to two or three people i've had clients do like two other people but they can call on your behalf in, in regards to asking social security questions so that's wow. cool. that's a new one i hadn't heard that yet 
Mm -hmm. So I've, that's happened to a couple of my clients when they needed to access it. And that's just because if they needed to adjust usually like the withholding for taxes, or if they need to like turn it off to like zero, or if they need to make some updates to change, what happens is really the changing of the bank account. Like that's not as easy as you would think to change where those funds get posted to. And so that's why having access to that. So really, I would say that's the number one document is really that like websites and the link to the different things or just having knowing where to access that. And then as far as other documents, I would say that has been really helpful for clients other than the list of doctors checklist. Actually, I think that's about it that I can think of off the top of my head. There's probably more and we can share that. Um, Yeah. I, I was thinking through that. I, one of my very good girlfriends, husband passed suddenly two, three years ago. And just, I, because I was out of state, the only thing I could really help with, because I couldn't be there, was doing research about what does she do now? And, you know, I'll make sure to link to that in the, in the show notes, because it, it was a lot, it was hours worth of research. And like, what do you do? Who do you, who do you call? What do you need to consider? You know, Call your accountant, call your wealth advisor, call your, you know, whoever it is. And and that's key to like if something, if there's a sudden death, access the cash in advance. Like if you have cash in your checking account, it's a joint account or like really if it's like an individual account, get access to that cash first. Because once you notify a financial institution that the person has passed, they restrict your account. So then you don't necessarily have access to it as, as you thought it was. So we've seen that happen to clients where the account got restricted, but they didn't have access to cash. Like as far as their checking, they had money in their brokerage accounts, which you could send them, but um, not like as far as like with the banks. So that's a, a good thing to think about is just, and then making sure you're adding on your bank accounts too. If someone does pass away in advance, the either TOD transfer on death feature or POD for your banks payable on death. So that way that can just be an easy transition and, set, and it avoids like probate. You basically get to access that account a lot more quickly than versus waiting to go to court to really figure out the distribution of assets and getting access to that. Is that included with like living trust, trust, living trust, those kinds of things? Because I know there's some differences, will versus a trust. Yeah, a living trust is more like that advanced directives. And so that's really directing how that's, so that's actually different. The advanced directives and that's really giving the direction of in the event that you're only have six months to live, or if you have terminal illness, those, those type of decisions, mm-hmm. but at your bank, you can ask them to add on, I would ask them for the POD payable on death. If you can add that feature to your account and they should be able to do it um, pretty quickly or give you the form. Mm-hmm. And that's different from a beneficiary. Yeah, no, that's the same thing. You're adding beneficiaries to your account. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. okay. Yeah, okay. it's just so that you can access it uh, quickly. And yeah, same, absolutely. That's a good point, too. In your IRA accounts and your life insurance, making sure that you actually have primary and contingent beneficiaries. So even if this is not in the case that uh, a slow progressive, disorder, yeah. but this is in the case that you guys are both in a car together and you there's a car crash, like you die together, like your pri- your spouse was your primary beneficiary. You got to make sure whoever's contingent is listed, who's the second one to get. And usually that's the case if the, the children are older adults, uh, making sure you're listing them, however, or if you, if you do want to list them <laughs> as your beneficiaries. What if you had one half of a couple come into you and say, I'm worried about all this. I need to get all this paperwork. You know, I need to get on accounts but the other spouse is resistant. Have you ever had this come up? As far as someone being resistant, not necessarily. I've had one client that would say that she likes to share a lot more than another client, I would say. And I've had one client that like, they're, they're a couple, but I usually meet just with one individual versus the other. I have that. And usually what they'll do is they'll just relay those messages to their significant other or their partner. But as far as resistance, it's it's not necessarily resistance, but not like necessarily avoidance. They're just not interested is what I would call mm-hmm. And in that case, that's when it's just, that's where you like the, as a wealth advisor, we usually similar if you're probably, um, we follow up with meeting notes and I just make sure to copy both spouses because in the event, if something happens, they at least know what's happening. 
uh, you have the follow-up emails, you have the different links, you, they know they can figure out a way to access that information if they need it to. It should have that history of our conversation. So I think that's been key. But as far as I, yeah, I'm trying to think if there's ever been a way that I've like persuaded the other spouse to get really engaged. And the way I've done it is if I'm speaking their language. And that means if I'm attuning to say they really love a specific football team, then I'll try to give them different analogies that way. Like it's, it's, it's trying to relate to them on a, a different level and or sometimes the best way is like through travel like if I can find out oh you really love to go traveling here well if we do xyz we can probably make this your vacation instead of 10 days 15 days and I'll show you how like I'll do that as far as like projection so that's it's finding ways to engage the client if they're not as receptive but other than that there's no there's no really way to to make them do anything they don't want to right, yeah yeah <laughs> but it, it you bring up a great point. It is about building rapport, finding a common, lowest common denominator that you can relate on. And, and as you build that rapport and, and they build confidence in you, then they're more likely to open up. Because I think when we had met before, you had told me about a client that came in and was wanting to do the wealth management, but wasn't completely upfront with you about all the things that were going on. And it took time for them to, well, I also have this, or I also have this that I hadn't told you about yet. And so they'll give you the obvious stuff, but maybe not some of the- True. I think when you're building the relationship right off the bat in the beginning, it takes time for people to open up. And that's in all due respect, I wouldn't I wouldn't want you to be a client if you didn't take time to build that trust because then I'd be worried. <laughs> you trust people that easily. But either so, what I've seen, and generally I can get facts. That's what the tax return review is. So I'll review their tax return, and that gives us a lot of information. And that meaning, like they'll get a K1 to say if they have a, this other trust or if they're invested in this one uh, outside business. I can see that in their tax return. I can also see if they itemize deductions and give to charities. That's another thing, a common denominator. If I see like, oh, I see that you give to the Boys and Girls Club. Oh, that's perfect. Like I used to volunteer there. Like that's something that you can engage them and then you can figure out like, what what would you like to do? Like, do you want to, I see that you gave 10,000. Do you want to give 20,000 next year? Do you want to do a matching grant? Like we, I do a lot of charitable planning with clients as well. Cause like I mentioned about living joyfully, it's also about the impact that you're making in the community. How are you making a difference? Is your life <clears throat> legacy going to be just like your everyday things? Or is it going to be, um, if I'm going to see your name on, like in Central Texas Food Bank, they have the Nourish with all the different donors around it. Is your name going to be on that wall? And so people can see it. I think that's the idea is we all, I also try to make sure that clients optimize the dollars that they have to them and that they also give away a certain portion and so for clients you can if they are still working generally people give away between five to ten percent of their income and we can open up a donor advice fund a DAF account and they'll do uh, or send some of their appreciated stock into that account so say if they worked for like google they'll give they'll grant some of that stock into that donor advice fund if i have clients that have already retired they can still do that as well but generally we change that number instead of 10 percent of what they're giving annually maybe one percent of their net worth and one percent may seem a lot but if we start off granting to different organizations then their name they're they're building their name in the community i had one client who helped build not necessarily built but they added an addition to a library and then they were there to celebrate it when they launched the new the new library and the this is one and this is one really but like a small community so i think that's that's yeah. when they can see like being recognized enjoying what they're donating to even when we have clients like here in austin they give to like the harry ransom center harry ransom center is free like you can just go in it's not like the blanton where you had a membership or anything you can just go in and see all the different exhibits and that's another thing that i like to tell clients about is 
generally when we have meetings, I like to tell them either one to three things of like what's happening in the community. Hey, have they heard of this nonprofit that they could donate to? I'm really advocating for all the different community resources and things that they can go out there because that's another, not that clients get bored. Actually, my retirees are probably the most active people I know. They have like Pilates and they're going to go to like bowling. And <laughs> they have all these different things. Throw some pickleball in there too. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, Neat. Well, Glenda, this was a lot of wonderful information and I'm grateful to know you. I love your passion, your enthusiasm. You know so much and I love how you network. It's, it's real. I'm, it was meant for us to connect and to do this episode, to try and get more information out that whether it's a family has an sudden diagnosis or something that's going to take longer there is a way to plan for your financial future and to work with someone like yourself to help give that control back agreed i think that's the key thing is that i'm a resource available to clients to prospects to new individuals and even if and we'll share that link too if they just want to have a 15-minute introduction call i think that would be great just to see like hey this is my situation. Is this something you can help? Is this going to be uh, like the right fit? And if it's not, like I said, I have additional resources. I'm well connected here in, in the Austin community, but elsewhere as, as well. I have clients all over the different coastlines nationwide, New York, Florida, Washington. And so usually it's the same thing. I'll ask my clients to be like, hey, can you find out like other resources in that area? I think that's the thing is I love to help people like in and that really, uh, that's always stemmed. Like I've always been that way since I was younger, but especially because when I went to college, I had a full ride with the, and that was the Terry Foundation and their motto is to give back. So I try every day to give back in a way. And if it's not volunteering, like I mentioned at the Central Texas Food Bank or the Austin Creative Reuse Re Re Center, like there's different places. And I think that's where I get a lot of fulfillment from is really just helping people, helping the community and having a good time. It's like so much fun. And I hope that's why that's where I get all my joy from. If you can see, but <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love it. This is wonderful. Glenda, thank you so much for being with us today. And folks, I will link all of Glenda's information in the show notes. And as always, you can check this out on YouTube on all the audio podcasts. You also can go to the listen for life aphasia podcast.com. And when you go there, you have access to all episodes. You are, I believe, 110. Episode 110. Mm -hmm. number. Congrats. Uh, awesome. What's really cool about that website, folks, if you haven't checked it out, I have this wonderful, cute little robot that can access every single minute of these episodes. So if you wanted to know what were those documents I need, you know, or you have, you want some caregiver information, you want to know the different kinds of aphasia, whatever it is, the robot can steer you to which episode and even give you the paragraph and show you the video of what you're searching for. So. And That's I use your website. It's an amazing resource and awesome. I, I appreciate it. <laughs> so thank yeah, you for doing it as well. Good. When I when I came across that platform, I'm like, yes, that's what I need to have. That's what because what use is information if we can't get it to the people. Exactly. Well, thank you, Glenda. And if you'll hang on, folks, we will see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to the Listen for Life podcast. We hope you feel empowered and supported. Head over to listenforlifepodcast.com to see the show notes with links and information from today's episode. Do you have a topic, a resource to share, or a guest recommendation? Inquiring minds want to know. Let us know in the comments section. Wishing you a fabulous week.